back of the channel. This tutorial is going to cover all aspects of solar image post-processing. It assumes you already have some raw data captured. We're going to show you how to get the very best out of your data. I made my first solar post-processing video back in 2022. Since then, I've processed and captured literally thousands of solar images, and I've won a NASA APOD for one of my solar images, and I've interviewed many of the world's top solar imagers to learn their tips and tricks. I'm going to include all that information and experience in this video for you. Post-processing of solar images is a multi-step procedure. First, you have to convert the video capture file into an image. Then you sharpen and stretch the image. Then you may further denoise and sharpen the image. Finally, you may choose to add color and make other final adjustments. If you're making a solar animation, you may repeat these steps hundreds of times in a batch process and then convert the final series of images into a time-lapse animation. The first piece of software you're going to use is AutoStackert. This is software which is made only for Windows and a link is provided in the notes. Let's have a look at it. So here's what version four of AutoStackert looks like. You wanna be sure you've got the current version. For stacking solar images, use the following settings. Surface, improve tracking, expand, and normal data should be around four, three if you have exceptionally good data. You can use automatic, but I tend to choose what I think it is myself. All right, at that point, then what you want to do is analyze the data. Under analyze, you don't want to select double stack reference, but you do want to select automatic. Under stack options, you want to choose TIFF and 200 frames to stack. I've experimented with taking a percentage of good frames and varying the number of frames stacked based on the quality of the capture. But ultimately, after processing hundreds and hundreds of images, I found it's simply best to take the best 200 images, and that gives a good result. 100 frames is generally a bit too noisy. More than 200, even with good data, doesn't really change the outcome. You can, of course, also fill in multiple boxes here. I could say, give me the best 33% as well as the best 200 or some other number here. In this case, I'm simply going to say the best 200 frames. You do not want to select sharpened. You're going to sharpen this later. As you move the frame slider, you're going to see how the software ordered your frames from best to worst on the right. So in theory, the very best frame right here is frame number 108 of 1033. And the very worst frame is frame number 266. You can also just slide this back and forth and make your own call as to where you want to start stacking. But again, I, I would recommend you just use 200. Generally speaking, having about a thousand alignment points is optimal. So if I select 104 here, for example, for an a, uh, alignment point size and I place the grid, it's going to give me 102 alignment points. And that's not going to be enough. So let's take this down to 32, try again. Now I've got 1240, that's a reasonable number for stacking. If you set the alignment points at a very, very low number here, so you end up with thousands and thousands of them, you can get undesired artifacts in the final image. I always want to select replace and multi-scale. If you want to see if you have proms in the image, you can click the brightness here and you can see one's popped up here on the limb. Take that back down again to normal just to see where it is. This quality graph is interesting to look at, but generally does not provide a lot of information that's helpful. There's not always the best correlation between the graph here and the quality of the data, so I tend to ignore it. You want to leave drizzle off at first. If you get a very good result, you might consider redoing it with drizzle at 1.5. I find it's more useful on broadband images and full disk images than close-ups, but it can make a difference. I normally have drizzle off for most images. In some cases, adding drizzle can smooth your result, but it does add significantly to your processing time. You can also consider stacking them both with and without drizzle, and then choosing the result 
at the IMPPG stage that follows that works best. To batch process, you want to select similar pictures from the capture folder and drag them into the image part of AutoStacker. I do this, for example, when I'm doing a mosaic of six photos to create a full disk image. The output from AutoStacker is going to be a TIFF file. So if I now stack this, we are ready to go and we have a TIFF file of the 200 best images stacked together. Now let's go on to IMPPG. Let's talk about IMPPG. Some people use Registrax for sharpening solar images and they get good results. However, in my discussions with expert solar imagers, IMPPG is a clear preference as it's optimized for sharpening solar images. It's free, but it only supports Windows. A link is provided in the notes. There is an alternative you can consider called NAIF, which I'll discuss in a few moments. I spent some time with Philip Cesarek, who's the creator of IMPPG, and the following workflow follows his general recommendations. First of all, you want to go to Settings, Processing Backend, and be sure that your graphics card is selected if you have one. That optimizes your performance. Now, we're first going to talk about how to sharpen hydrogen alpha solar images. There's a different process for broadband sunspot type images. So for hydrogen alpha, when IMPPG opens, there'll be a small box around part of the sun. You can use your mouse to reposition and change the size of the box if you want. On the tone curve, you want to click log and then stretch, and then you'll see maximum contrast. You can use your mouse to choose any size you want, or you can simply click on the box at the top left here, and that will do the entire image at once. On the tone curve, you can click log, and then you can click stretch. That'll give you more contrast. You might want to zoom in a bit and you want to move into an area that has some detail like this large filament, for example. And the first thing you want to do is start with the Lucy Richardson deconvolution. I find that the default of 1.3 is too much in most cases. It's rare, but occasionally I do go above 1.3. Much more commonly, I'm going to be between 0.7 and 1. If you look here, you can see that that's too much. We're going to back off maybe somewhere around you know, 0.8 or so. It's generally good to set the setting where you think it looks best and then drop it just a little bit. It's very easy to over sharpen. So then what we can do is we can then go to the unsharp mask. It's the next stage. And again, that's way too much and back that off, get that to where you think it might be about right. The sigma often has a similar number to the uh, LR deconvolution. So I'll drop that down to around, we'll say 0.9. Okay, and now here's where the magic happens. We're gonna go to the tone curve and add a point and then stretch it up to this area and bring this one down. Now what that's done is it's inverted the image. And so, Filaments, which normally are dark, appear light, and it gives you much more of a 3D appearance and generally is preferred by most people. Now, you could stop right here, but there's a lot of ways you can make this a bit better. So we can raise that a bit. Now, what you find is that you're going to be working from the left side to the right side of the tone curve. So if I move a point here, it's a bit more detail on the prominence. And then I'm going to be moving to, along to the edge here. And some people like to have a nice bright edge. Now, I never leave this curve the way it is. I find if it falls off a bit, like a little bit of a ski hill, then it's a little bit more convex. It gives you a better result. So I might raise it a bit here and then pull it down a bit there. And what that does is it gives you a bit more contrast in this area of the sun. And you can, you can zoom in. Again, I've got so much sharpening here there now. So now that I've adjusted the tone curve, I'm going to go back and drop this a bit more. This is the second time around. Drop that to about there. Drop that to about there. So that gives you a good idea of what it should be like. You don't want to have any sharp corners on your tone curve. It should be smooth all the way around. You don't want to have any, area, any areas too black. You'd rather have them gray to pull out some detail. So what we can also do here is, I'll bring this back to the full size. 
you can add a point here and you can drag this point up to the top and then bring this over here. That's another technique. I think in this case, though, I'm going to leave it there and try to get some detail on the prominence. So that's a, that's a reasonable step, I think, for IMPPG. And if you have multiple images that you want to sharpen together, like, for example, sometimes I will capture six images in a mosaic of the sun, and then I'll combine them all together. You can do batch processing in IMPPG. So to do that, you go to File, Batch Processing, then you would add your files here. You would select a saved settings file, and then that's the output place that it goes. And then you sit, start processing, and it happens pretty quickly. So that's how you can do multiple ones at once. It's also useful if you're doing an animation, because then you can do a whole lot of them at once. So let's look at one more example. This is a full disk image. And of course, this is the previous setting we had before. We'll, we'll just reset that and start again from scratch. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stretch the image. That gives me maximum contrast. Again, this is going to be uh, too much sharpening. I'm going to back this off a bit. I'll move it around a bit. Let's see, maybe I'll actually increase it. I'll try that for that. I'm going to make it a full disk image. And obviously, we've stretched it so it doesn't look quite right. I'm going to reset that. I'll just do this quickly. I don't want to get too much glare around the outside either. A little bit can be okay. There's some detail here I want to look at. Bring this down a bit. And zoom in and look at this filament and we'll play with the sharpening. This is the case where I'm actually going above 1.3. This is a rare circumstance though. Okay, so we can see the prominences on the limb. There's some little ones up here and here. I'll pull more of those out in a later step. It depends how much glow you want to have on your limb. That does give us a bit better prom view. So that's another example of how we might use IMPPG. All right, so now we want to talk about how we use IMPPG for broadband or white light images. It's a different process. So we're going to reset things again. And I'm now going to open up a new file, which has got an image of the broadband sun. Now, this particular image won me an APOD from NASA in May of 2023. This is a uh, very high detailed image of the sun. The sunspot with a light bridge running across the middle of it. Now, in this case, for broadband images, you never want to use Lucy Richardson deconvolution. So you're going to disable it by clicking here. You're only going to be using the unsharp mask. And so we zoom in a bit, and I'm going to drag this over. And you go too far and then back off again. Something around there. You want to see detail in the the umbra, the penumbra, and the granulation, the little pores here as well, if you can. And then here on the actual tone curve, we're not going to do too much. If you drag this to the left, you make the umbra darker. And there's a little bit of detail inside the umbra I don't want to lose. So I'm not going to do that, but I may drop it a bit and then raise it a little bit over here. So I find very subtle changes in the tone curve for broadband are all you need, just to get a nice contrast of light to dark. And then go back and recheck your sharpening. You don't want to go too far, but that shows good detail inside the sunspot and along that light bridge that came across the middle. And that's a pretty good looking image. So again, the main difference with broadband images and IMPPG is you do not want to use the LR deconvolution, only want to use 
the uh, unsharp mask. So hope that's helpful. And now we're on to the next stage. There's some other lesser known software you can use to sharpen your images. And that's called NAFE, N-A-F-E. And there's a new version just been released uh, early this year in 2024. So you want to be, for, be sure you have that version. And I've experimented with it and I can get some very good results, especially on broadband images. So here's an example. You can decide for yourself if it's something you want to include in your workflow. It's free software for Windows and I will include a link at the end of the video. So once you've opened your image, you can click activate down here and it's gonna run the sharpening process. So we have to wait for that to complete and see the progress bar down here. All right, so that has been done. And I'm going to increase the view. I can adjust the sharpening by sliding the NAFE slider here from you know basically no sharpening all the way up to the desired amount. So it seems it is giving us some that's probably too much, I think. But somewhere in this range, 0.07 or 0.1 is a nice amount. You can uh, run your NAFE on both auto stacker images and on IMPPG images. In my experience, it can give some pretty good results. It does not include a tone curve function, so it doesn't pull out problems on limb detail like IMPPG does. What you can also do is you can take your NAFE image and you can blend it as a separate layer with Photoshop or Affinity Photo into your IMPPG image at 30 to 60% for a combined effect. And that is more work, but can give you a pretty cool result sometimes as well. You can also adjust these sliders to change the white level if you want to make it brighter. And you can change the black level if you want to darken it. So playing around with these things can give you really a very pleasant image. You can see this is very sharp, very detailed with great contrast. So that's not a bad result. And when you're done, you can simply save it and you're good to go. All right, so that's a quick look at NAFE. And now let's talk about the next stage, which is the final processing stage. I'll use Affinity Photo. There are lots of good post-processing programs out there. I use Affinity Photo. Affinity Photo is much like Photoshop, but there's no subscription cost, just a one-time modest fee. It's compatible with both Mac and Windows and has a lot of astrophotography specific macros, which are really helpful for nighttime astrophotography processing as well. All right, so let's get started looking at this image of the sun. The first thing I'm gonna do is go under document, format, and convert it from black and white mono to RGB 16. And you notice this area turned color. So now we have a color image. Now we want to give it a nice sun color. So what I'm gonna do is hit Control M for the curves function. And then I'm going to select the red channel. I'm gonna drag it up one square, make this pretty easy. The blue channel, I'll drag it down one square. I'll take the green channel. And I find you get a nice effect if you do a subtle S curve with the green channel with the lower part a bit lower than the upper part. So you've got a nice rosy gold color on the sun. We're gonna show you how to make that a macro in a moment. In fact, let's just do that right now. So I'm going to undo what I just did with a control Z. Now I'm gonna go under macro. I'm gonna say record. I'm gonna hit control M and we're gonna do this all over again. All right, done. So that's the curve section. I'll hit stop recording. I'm gonna give it a name. I'll call it sun color three. I'll say, okay. 
Now under my library, I have a new one called Sun Color 3. So if I undo my prior action, I click Sun Color 3. That allows me in one click now to color any future solar image. Plus it allows me to give exactly the same color to all my subsequent solar images. So they all look consistent. So the macro function is really helpful. You'll see, for example, I've got a function here which converts me from mono to color, adds 40% clarity, and then converts the color to the color that I want. So let's talk about this clarity uh, filter. The clarity filter is one of the ways we're going to sharpen the image. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit by hitting Control plus plus. And then I'm going to go under Layer, New Live Filter Layer, Sharpen, Clarity. And when I drag this to the right, you'll see it sharpens things up. Now, I don't want to go too far. Generally, 40% is my first shot with the clarity filter. That's a good default for me. And then another way you can do sharpening is with the unsharp mask. So we're going to go to Layer, uh, New Live Filter Layer, Sharpen, Unsharp Mask. Now with the unsharp mask, the radius in pixels will determine where the sharpening occurs. So for example, if I put in two pixels here, what that's going to do is sharpen up the fine structures on the surface. So I'm going to zoom in here and take a look at this prom. Now take a look at the prom now after sharpening and I'll click on this button to visibility off and on, off and on. So a two pixel unsharp mask will sharpen up details in proms and spicules along the edge. What if you want to sharpen up, let's say, a, a larger filament like that? Well, then you might go to, I'll do another art unsharp mask. So we'll go to Layer, New Life Filter Layer, Sharpen, Unsharp Mask. And I'm going to make this a factor of 1 and a radius of 25. Now when I, I'll go back to the full screen, I unclick it. It's a pretty dramatic sharpening. And that's to me, that's way over sharpened. What I do like is how it makes the filaments pop on the surface. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to undo that function completely. I'm going to zoom back in with Control plus plus. I'm going to use my selection brush and you can change the size of the selection brush with the square bracket key, smaller or larger. I'm going to select this filament right here and also the one beside it. And also this one here, just for grins. I'm just going to do a quick job. Now, if I click Subtract, I can get rid of any areas that were really not part of the filament. So let's just clean this up just really quickly. All right, I think that's good for a ballpark amount. Now I'm going to go under Select and Feather, and I'm going to add a two pixel radius, a three pixel radius. And that's going to smooth out the edges so it's not such an abrupt transition. And now if I go under Layer, New Life Filter Layer, Sharpen, Unsharp Mask, and I put in a 25 pixel sharpening, and hit Close, and hit Escape. Now I'm going to go back to my full disk image and take a look at those filaments off and on, off and on. You can see how they pop off the surface with that selective sharpening. So that's something I think I'll stick with. The next thing I'll do at this point is go to my Topaz Denoise plugin. So I'll filters, plugins, Topaz Labs. Okay, it's not working because I need to do a new pixel layer. All right, now we should be happy. So I'm running the plugin. And what this is going to do is clean up the noise around the proms and somewhat on the surface as well. Let's have a look. I'm going to zoom 
Now, the choices are four models, standard, clear, low light, severe noise, I guess five, raw. I always use low light on the sun. I always get the best results with that. And I almost always choose the default automatic selection. It almost always gives the best result. Sometimes I will back off the sharpness, but let's take a look at this image here. Look at the structure in this prom before and after. I think it's significantly better in the after. This despicable right here is much more clear. This little tendril of, of plasma off this particular prom is more clear now. The background is smoother. Here it's more mottled and noisy. Here it's smooth. The structure in this prom area looks a lot better here and here. And let's go look on the surface of the sun around the sunspot area. A little more subtle, but again, I think this is an improvement as well. So I'm going to just click on apply. All right, now you could say you're done at this point, but I'm going to go a little further and I'm going to select the tone mapping persona. And when you do that, it defaults to 100% tone compression. So just drag this back to here. And this is kind of where we started. I'm going to hit Control plus plus again to have a closer look. All right. Now, this local contrast function is very useful for both deep sky and solar work. I'm going to drag this to the right and watch the surface of the sun. Now, it's affecting the hue as well. This is obviously way too much. I find sometimes adding a few percent, five percent. I mean, look at the uh, prom at the bottom as I raise the local contrast. It pops a bit more against the background. So I'm going to leave this at, say, seven percent. I generally don't change these settings much. The overall contrast is another way you can improve the darkness of the background if you don't have Topaz uh, Noise DI. So I'm going to click 1% here, and you can see this background area got darker. I'll turn it off again and on again. So that's another solution you have for cleaning up this background area. I'm not going to adjust the saturation or vibrance because I'm really happy with my colors already. But you can do that if you want. The shadows and highlights is another way that you can darken some of these backgrounds if you drag shadows left you can see the difference here i think i'll leave it where it was it's pretty good you can also brighten things up along the rim if you want to have a more of a rosy glow on the limb you can add a couple percent on highlights but my original image was actually pretty good so i'm not going to mess with this much at all all right so i'll say apply And I think I've got a pretty good result at this point. So now we're going to do this again on a different image, just so you can quickly see the process on a different type of solar image. So I'm going to go over to this one. This is a uh, solar full disk, FSD, full solar disk. has gone through the IMPPG function. Now you see I've got a macro over here where I convert from mono to color to RGB 16. I add color and I do 40% clarity in one keystroke. I'm going to do that. So that's a beautiful, quick way to go from there. I'm going to zip over here to Topaz Labs and run my denoise function. Again, I'm going to zoom 400%. I'm going to look for an interesting area on the sun. And you can see how this is a bit blurry and this has sharpened it up a bit. Now, maybe this is a bit too sharp. Again, it's a judgment call. I'm going to back off this to about half the amount of sharpening that was there before. I'm going to pull the white box down and look at another area. You can see these proms shooting out from the uh, sunspot area. Let's just take a look at this area. I think that looks pretty good. So I'm going to hit apply. And now we're back to our full solar disk. In this case, I don't think these filaments need any more sharpening. They look pretty good and they're very three-dimensional. So I'm going to just zip over here again to the tone mapping persona. I'll reduce my tone compression back to 
zero. I'll play with a local contrast. Yeah, I think this original document, this, I think this original picture looks pretty darn good. I'll try adding a percent of contrast, darken the background a bit. Maybe that's better. And we'll play with the shadows and highlights for a moment. A lot of this is experimentation, just seeing what your personal preference is. I think that's pretty good. Highlights are fine. I'm going to call that good. So you can see with the use of macros, I was able to completely finish processing this image in only three or four minutes. So it really speeds things up for you. And they've got a beautiful full solar disk, looks very three-dimensional. Now, the last thing I'd like to show you today is what if you have to do a mosaic? Like for example, I have a number of different solar cameras, but when I use my Mars M camera, it cannot give me a full solar disk with my Launch 100 MT solar telescope. And so I have to do what's called a mosaic, where I overlap a number of pictures and then use this program to create a new single image. So let's take a look at how you would do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to File, New Panorama, Add, and I go to the folder that has the images of the sun that I want. So here are six images. These two images are with and without drizzles. So I'm just checking the the uh, without drizzle as an example. And once I've selected those, I hit open. They're all pulled in here. I simply click on Stitch Panorama. And there it is, I'll click on OK. And photo is going to do its magic. All right, so there we are. And from there, I'm going to click on the Crop tool and bring this in a bit. Hit enter. Now I can use apply and to, I'll hit control zero to center it. Now I've got a few artifacts from that uh, panorama function. I'll get rid of those with the in-painting brush tool. So I'm gonna press the square bracket to increase the size. I'll drag it there, I'll make it larger still. I'll drag it here and we should be good to go. One more click there. Okay, now at this point, what I would do is save this as a TIFF and then go back and run my IMPPG and then come back again to this program to process it. Alternatively, what I could have done is taken my six stacked images from AutoStackert run IMPPG on those six, and then brought them in here and combined them in the program and gone directly from there. So I hope this has been helpful. That's how I use Affinity Photo to finish up my solar processing. And I look forward to seeing images that you guys create. Thanks for watching.